the question this morning is, should evangelicals reunite with the Roman Catholic Church? Was the Reformation a mistake? Should we join hands again with Roman Catholics to fight the social and moral issues of our day? Has the Roman Catholic Church distorted the gospel? Well, open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 6 through 9. We'll see how the Apostle Paul handled those who were distorting the gospel 2,000 years ago. He writes his epistle with an urgent response to a report that the Galatian churches were being bewitched by professing Christians who were distorting the gospel. This is Paul's only epistle that he does not begin with a commendation because the Galatians had drifted away from God and his gospel. He gets right to the point with a vigorous defense of the gospel and the very doctrine of justification by which faith apart from works of the law is proclaimed. So in Galatians 1, verses 6 to 9, read along with me. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Well, let's examine this passage with three observations. Now, the first observation is Paul's amazement at the Galatians deserting Christ, as we see in verse 6. Then we see Paul's awareness of the Galatians' unwillingness to contend for the gospel in verse 7. And then in verses 8 and 9, we see Paul's anathema on anyone who distorts the gospel. So we see Paul driving a stake in the ground because the purity of the gospel is under attack. Remember, Paul spent his entire ministry proclaiming, defending, and contending for the gospel of grace. So Paul is direct and confrontational because there's so much at stake. His divine curse on those who distort the gospel is absolutely necessary because there is no other way to be saved. So let's look at the first observation, Paul's amazement at the Galatians deserting Christ. He writes, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. So we see Paul is amazed the Greek word means to wonder, to marvel, or to be struck with astonishment. We find it most often in the Gospels when people are amazed at the miracles of Christ. A good example we find in Matthew chapter 8, verse 27. After Jesus commanded the storm to cease, the men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? So Paul was astonished and in deep distress that the Galatians were deserting God, the one who called them by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. The word deserting means to transfer your allegiance. They were literally turning against God to follow false teachers. And the verb is in the present tense, indicating that their defection was still in progress. If they had gone all the way and abandoned the gospel, they would have been like the apostates in 1 John chapter 2, verse, nine, verse uh, 19. If you're familiar with that, they went out from us because they were never part of us. Had they been part of us, they would have remained with us. Another way John could have said that is they went out from us because they were never born of the Spirit. Had they been born of the Spirit, they would have remained with us. So if there were some false believers in the Galatian churches, they may have departed from the church to follow the false teachers known as the Judaizers. We're seeing this today more than ever. Many Protestants are leaving their churches to join the Roman Catholic Church. And after 32 years of ministry, we get so many 911 calls from parents whose son or daughter has been dating a Catholic and has chosen to marry them. And over this 32 years of ministry, nine out of 10 times, 
when a Catholic marries a Protestant, it is the Protestant who joins the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I find this really troubling. You and I are given the truth of God's word, and we are to stand on it and contend for it. But yet we are the first ones to compromise when it comes down to uniting with Roman Catholicism. Catholicism stands on a false and fatal gospel. They are unwilling to compromise. And so this is very troubling. And more than ever, I think we, t we need to instruct our children not to date Roman Catholics. They have a false gospel. So what about the true believers in Galatia? We talked about those who had never been born of the Spirit. They had uh, a possibility of drifting away. But what about the true believers? Well, they are accused of tolerating a false gospel that replaces grace, truth, and freedom with rules, rituals, and religion. They were not resisting the Judaizers, but instead were tolerating their false teachers. We see the same thing happening today. Many Christians are tolerating false gospels. Instead of resisting the false and fatal gospel of the Roman Catholic Church, they're saying, let's have unity with them. We need to fight the social and moral wars that are going on today. Later, we will see that the Roman Catholic Church has distorted the gospel greater than the Judaizers had. In this verse that we see here, verse 6, the word for quickly can also mean easily. Paul says, so you are quickly or easily deserting him for a different gospel. It is another gospel. The Greek word heteros means another of a different kind. Something that is heterodox is another of a different kind. Orthodox is the same. Heterodox is something different. So they were moving toward a different gospel, a gospel of a different kind. And Paul is not concerned that they would lose their salvation, but that they would tolerate something other than the gospel of grace that saved them. So why is there only one gospel? Have you ever considered that? Well, God's gospel is the only way his perfect and unchanging attributes of holiness, righteousness, and justice can work in harmony with his love, mercy, and grace to redeem sinners from the punishment, the power, and the presence of sin. This amazing gospel could not have been devised by man, but only in the infinite and profound wisdom of God. This is why Paul said it was revealed to him by God and not by man. Look at verses 11 and 12. Paul said, The gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. When we look at the cross of Christ, we see God's glorious attributes on display his holiness and having eyes too, look, too pure to look at sin, his righteousness and demanding perfect justice, his justice in condemning and punishing sin, his love in sending his son to die for guilty sinners, his mercy in rescuing sinners from eternal punishment, and his grace in providing the gift of eternal life. All of God's attributes, harmonious, at the cross of Christ. Every aspect of the greatness and glory of God is put on full display. All of God's attributes were displayed in perfect harmony at Calvary's cross. It was there that the sinless Savior offered himself as the sinner's substitute to satisfy divine justice. This is the only way God can be both just and the justifier of the unjust. This demonstration of God's holiness, justice, and righteousness without compromising his love, mercy, and justice is what distinguishes biblical Christianity from all the religions of the world. This is the gospel of God that we must guard as the most valuable of all treasures. The second observation we want to look at is Paul's awareness of the Galatians' unwillingness to contend for the gospel which is really not another. There are some who are disturbing you 
in want to distort the gospel of Christ. Paul declares dogmatically another gospel is not another gospel. It must remain pure. Nothing can be added to it. Remember, the Judaizers were professing Christians. They believed in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just like Catholics do today, they believe in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But just like the Judaizers, they have added to the gospel of grace, thus distorting it. They were also disturbing the Galatians, and the word there means to stir up or to agitate. The same word is used by Jesus speaking to his disciples who were disturbed in John 14.1. There we see Jesus saying, stop letting your hearts be troubled. The disciples were agitated and confused because the Lord had told them he was going to die and depart from them. So the Galatians were accused of tolerating a false gospel that replaces grace and freedom with rules and rituals. And that's the goal of every religion, to control its people by rules and rituals. <laughs> The Galatians were not resisting the Judaizers, but instead were tolerating their false teaching. The Judaizers were exchanging the truth of God for the lie of the devil. They were distorting the gospel of grace by adding something to it. They were saying salvation could be obtained by what man can do rather than what God has done. They were insulting Christ by declaring his perfect work of redemption was not enough. They were requiring the, requiring the Gentiles to become Jewish proselytes and obey the Mosaic law in order to be saved. Their distortion was rattling the Galatian churches. The word distort can also mean to pervert or to transform something into an opposite character. Well, obviously, Satan is behind any attempt to distort the gospel. He is the master deceiver. He's behind every false teacher. And I would encourage you to turn to 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 4, to see just how Satan is behind every false teacher. When Paul wrote to the Corinthian church here in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 to 4, he said, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Don't miss this. Paul's reprimand. You bear this beautifully. You put up with it. You put up with a distorted gospel. Rather than defending the purity of the gospel, you are tolerating a perversion of it. The Galatians were doing the same thing as the Corinthians. They were not contending for the true gospel. And as a result, they were being led astray from their pure devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul questioned them later in this letter in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. He wrote, O foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? Well, the application is so profound for us today. The church cannot tolerate a false gospel. Christians must guard against false doctrines and protect the gospel of God. What hope do we have for the next generation if we don't guard the gospel today? The gospel of grace must be void of religious rituals, religious rites, and the works of the law. Law and grace can never, ever be mixed. And if you were here yesterday, you know how I like to teach antithetically, putting two opposing views side by side. Whenever the truth is laid alongside what is dark, the truth shines even brighter. So when we look at the law, the law says do, as we see in Galatians 5.3. Every man who receives circumcision is under obligation to keep the whole law. But grace says done. 
In John 19.30, when Jesus had accomplished everything necessary to save sinners completely and forever, he cried out in victory, it is finished. The work has been done. The law reveals sin, as we see in Romans 7.7. Paul said, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. But grace forgives sin, as we see in Ephesians 1.7. In him we have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And then the law condemns, as we see in James 2.10. If whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at just one point has become guilty of breaking the entire law. And grace justifies. We see that in Romans 3.24. Sinners are justified as a gift by his grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Condemnation and justification are opposites. Everybody on this earth either stands condemned before a holy and righteous God or they have been justified because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The law causes death, as we see in Romans 3.23. The wages of sin is death, but grace brings to life, as we see in Ephesians 2.5. God made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. The law brings bondage, as we see in Galatians 2.4. The false brethren sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage through the law. Grace brings freedom, as we see in Galatians 5.1. It was freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. What a contrast between law and grace. And yet so many religions today put their people in bondage because of legalism and obeying the law. This is why Paul was so upset with the Galatians for not contending for the gospel of pure grace. It must be purely of grace, and it cannot be mixed with the law. Later in the epistle, Paul wrote, You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Chapter 5, verse 4. So the third observation we want to look at is Paul's anathema on anyone who distorts the gospel. He wrote, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Paul gives a direct and confrontational warning here. He knows he will never preach a false gospel, but he's making a point. It doesn't matter who you are. Anyone who perverts the gospel is to be accursed. In verse 9, he repeats himself so that there will be no misunderstanding. Can you sense how outraged Paul is here? He's furious that the gospel of God that he preached to the Galatian churches has now come under assault. And he is shocked that they were tolerant of a distorted gospel. He's also concerned and distressed because they cannot discern the true gospel from a counterfeit gospel. Well, there's an important application for all of us today. And I want to address that in a few minutes. Paul didn't say, let's have unity with these professing Christians. After all, they believed in Jesus, his death and resurrection, No, he brought down a divine curse on the Judaizers. There's some other important applications for all of us today. Can we discern the true gospel from a false gospel? Do we know the gospel well enough to identify and expose a counterfeit? Are we tolerant of false gospels circulating within the professing church? Well, in verses 8 and 9, the word accursed is the Greek word anathema, It means to be turned over to God for destruction. And this is as harsh as God's word ever gets. 
pr pronouncing a damning curse on everyone or anyone who distorts or alters the gospel. You can see Paul is not holding anything back here. He is direct and he's confrontational. If you add anything to the gospel or take anything away from the gospel, you are to be turned over to God for destruction. To teach any other way of salvation other than through the perfect, all-sufficient work of Christ alone, you are to be damned. There's only one other warning of an anathema in the New Testament, and we see that in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. So Paul is declaring that love for the true God and the purity of his gospel are of utmost importance. So what does it mean to be accursed? The Lord Jesus describes it in Matthew 25, 41. He says, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So to be cursed is to be put away from the presence of Christ and thrown into an eternal fire prepared for the devil. So what can we take away from Paul's strong defense of the gospel? We can look at Galatians 2.5. Paul said, but we did not yield in subjection to them, the false brethren, for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. We can only wonder why more of our Christian leaders are not denouncing those who distort the gospel today. Is it because they want to be man-pleasers? Paul addressed this in chapter 1, verse 10. For I'm... Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Please don't miss this. What Paul is saying here, if we tolerate any false gospel, we are not pleasing our Lord Jesus Christ. If we are seeking the favor of men who compromise the gospel, then we are not pleasing to God. Several years ago, my wife and I found out that a Monsignor from the Roman Catholic Church was invited into Park City's Presbyterian Church in Dallas, and he was going to kick off a men's Bible study on the book of Romans. <laughs> it was going to be on Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock, so my wife and I got up at 5.30 and we drove down to Park City's Presbyterian because we wanted to warn all the men that were going in to listen to a wolf in sheep's clothing that the Roman Catholic Church upholds a false and fatal gospel. So we began passing out our gospel track entitled Rome versus the Bible to all the men that entered in. It wasn't about 15 minutes where the pastor came out and asked us to leave. I said, wait a minute, let me see if I have this straight. You've got a wolf in sheep's clothing about to teach your men, and you're asking a brother and sister in Christ to leave? He said, yes, that's what I'm asking. So we stepped off the curb, and we continued to pass out the gospel tracts to all the men that entered. We didn't want these men to be deceived. We didn't want to tolerate a false and fatal gospel that the Monsignor was going to preach to these victims of deception? Well, the question for all of us is, do we know the gospel well enough to spot a counterfeit? Let's consider the purity and the exclusivity of the gospel of grace. Paul defines the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. And whenever I'm witnessing and I open up to this passage, I let them know that there's only one name mentioned there. Your name is not mentioned. Mary's name is not mentioned. Your pastor's name is not mentioned. It's about one person, the eternal God incarnate, his virgin birth, and his perfect life. The gospel is about one person and two events, the atoning death of Jesus Christ and his glorious resurrection from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4, we read, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, 
that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the pure gospel of Christ. And you see it's contained fully in scripture. God's eternal son left the glories of heaven to be conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin so that he could take on human flesh. He lived in perfect obedience to God's law, then was crucified as the perfect sacrifice to satisfy divine justice. He bore man's sins, suffered God's wrath, and died in man's place and was raised on the third day to show that divine justice was satisfied. What a glorious gospel we have. What a glorious Savior we have in Christ Jesus. Well, let's look at the distortions of the gospel that were going on 2,000 years ago and are going on today. It is distorted by adding requirements for salvation, such as circumcision, which is what the Judaizers were doing. And today we see baptism has been added to the gospel, good works, legalism, human merit, sacraments, or anything else. We also see that the gospel is distorted by removing essentials. Let me ask you a question. Are we as outraged as the Apostle Paul was when we see Gospels being distorted? We cannot be passive or indifferent towards any distortion of the Gospel, but we must be as bold and courageous as Paul and stand for the truth of the Gospel. We are engaged in a spiritual war for the souls of men. This is the one battle, the one fight, the one war that really matters because it's a battle for the souls of men. And ultimately, it's a battle between the truth of God's word and the lies of the devil. You may know that there's only two things in this life that are eternal. The Lord had pressed upon me shortly after I was saved. The only two things eternal, the souls of men and the word of God. And that's where I wanted to invest the rest of my life on this earth the things that would last throughout all eternity. We know that everything else will perish. Everything else will be burned up. So let's invest in eternity. Do you know the essentials of the gospel that are most often removed from the gospel? They all begin with the letter R. There are those who leave out the resurrection of Christ. If Christ had not been raised, your your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. My wife and I were visiting a church in the Dallas area, and we looked at the bulletin, and it said, how to be saved. Two steps. Confess that you're a sinner and believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. The next week, I called the pastor. I said, did you happen to know you gave a false gospel? He said, what do you mean? He graduated from a very conservative seminary. I said, well, you left out the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so what this pastor did, he had a very teachable spirit. He thanked me for bringing it to his attention. And he'd already printed the 3,000 bulletins for the next week. He had them all destroyed so he could add the resurrection to the gospel. And then we have repentance. God commands all people to repent. His first command in Mark 1.15 was repent and believe the gospel. This is left out in so many gospel presentations today. And then the righteousness of God. It is revealed in the gospel, and it is necessary to be right with God. We see that in Romans 1.17. When you, whenever you engage people with the gospel, how often do they tell you, I hope I'm good enough to get to heaven. Well, nothing's changed in 2,000 years. Paul wrote, For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Romans 10.3 So to remove the righteousness of God from the gospel is to remove man's one and only passport into heaven because God's righteousness requires perfect righteousness for entrance into heaven. And praise God, because of the perfect life of our Lord Jesus, his perfect righteousness is given as a gift to those who will trust in him. Well, the greatest distortion of the gospel today 
is the plan of salvation in the Roman Catholic Church. Catholics have a great burden to carry in order to get to heaven. Their plan of salvation is by faith, and it's not the individual's faith. When a Catholic is baptized at seven days old, they are getting to heaven on the faith of their parents. And after they have faith, they have to be baptized. They also have to receive the sacraments. These numbers in the parentheses are paragraph numbers of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So this is the official <laughs> teaching of the Catholic Church. They must do good works in order to be justified. They must participate in the sacrifice of the Mass for the forgiveness of their sins. They must do penance before their sins can be forgiven. They must receive indulgences to remit temporal punishment for sin, and they must keep the law in order to be saved. This is the gospel according to the Roman Catholic religion. Remember the Judaizers were accused for distorting the gospel by adding only one requirement, you must be circumcised. Well, as you can see, this distorted gospel is much worse than the gospel that the Judaizers perverted. This distorted gospel is what evangelicals are now calling for unity with Roman Catholics. In fact, let me share with you a phrase out of the Manhattan Declaration. Some of you may be familiar with it. It came out in 2009, and it opened up with this statement. We are Christians, Catholics, Orthodox, and Evangelicals who have joined together across historic lines of ecclesial differences to proclaim the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his fullness. These evangelicals that have signed the accord are saying we share a common faith with Roman Catholics and their gospel. The statement, as you can see, is utterly false and misleading. Yet over 640,000 evangelicals have signed the Manhattan Declaration. This is how the gospel is under attack, its purity and exclusivity. I'm going to read to you some of the highly influential and highly visible leaders that have signed this accord. Because of their influence, many more evangelicals have signed it as well. Some of these names are going to shock you but you need to be aware of them. Ravi Zacharias, Al Mohler, J.I. Packer, Johnny Erickson Tata, Randy Alcorn, K. Author, Mark Bailey, former president of Dallas Seminary, Gary Bauer, James Dobson, Wayne Grudem, Tim Keller, Richard Land, Josh McDowell, and David Platt. Some of these people I have known personally, and I have pleaded with them to remove their names from the Manhattan Declaration. I told them they are confusing Christians by uniting with the Roman Catholic Church and its false and fatal gospel. By signing the Manhattan Declaration, they are being disobedient to God's word, which clearly commands, do not be bound together with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 6.14 not only are Catholics unbelievers, the Roman Catholic Church has issued over 100 anathemas on those who do not believe their dogmas. These evangelical leaders are also implying that the Reformation was a mistake and that Roman Catholics do not need to be evangelized. Because of their compromise, many Christians today do not know if the Roman Catholic Church represents a huge mission field made up of 1.3 billion precious souls, or if it's a Christian denomination made up of brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the travesty of evangelicals compromising with Rome for the sake of fighting moral and social issues. I believe this is why a recent message I gave in Southern California has exceeded over 1 million views now on YouTube. All I did in the message was show the seven major distinctions between biblical Christianity and Roman Catholicism. The message is entitled, You Will Be Shocked 
and it shows how evangelicals and Catholics can never, ever be united. I hope you see there is no more critical issue in the church today than guarding the purity and the exclusivity of the gospel. It is the rudder that must guide the church through stormy waters that have been stirred up by every wind of doctrine. And the heart of the gospel is what? The doctrine of justification. It's Luther said justification is the hinge upon which the gates of heaven open and close. If you get justification wrong, you get the gospel wrong. If you get justification wrong, you cannot be right with God. So what I'd like to do is walk you through how the Roman Catholic Church defines justification, and you will see it is in direct opposition to the biblical doctrine of justification. Well, first, let's define what the doctrine of justification is. It declares the inflexible justice of God as the righteous judge who cannot let the guilty go free. The only way condemned sinners can be justified is through faith in the sin-bearing, substitutionary death and resurrection of Christ alone who satisfied divine justice. So contrasting views on justification begin here. Justification, according to the Bible, is a change of one's legal status before God whereby a condemned sinner has been acquitted and declared righteous. Don't miss this. The reason there's a picture of a gavel on the screen is because it is a legal declaration. But Rome says, no, it's not. It changes the inner man, not his legal status. Paragraph 2019 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We also know that justification is instantaneous. The moment the gavel comes down, the condemned sinner is now justified instantly. But once again, Rome says no. It is a process. It is the ongoing renewal of the interior man. So Rome says initial justification is by the sacrament of baptism, water baptism, paragraph 992. But yet the Bible clearly says that justification is by faith in what God accomplished in Christ, Romans 5.1. The Bible teaches that justification is permanent and it is never lost by sin. The legal status of a justified man is as unchangeable as the righteousness of Christ. Hebrews 10.14 says this so clearly. By one offering... He has made perfect for how long? Forever, those who are being sanctified. A permanent right standing before God, our standing never changes. But once again, Rome says no. Justification is temporal. It can be lost by sin and regained through the sacrament of penance. That's why you see two arrows on the screen. When Roman Catholics do good works and receive sacraments, they improve their right standing before God. When a Roman Catholic sins, they lose some of their right standing before God. As a Roman Catholic for 35 years, I never ever knew where I stood before a holy and righteous God. In fact, I want to quote from the Catechism. If anyone says that the justice received is not preserved, and also not increase before God through good works, let him be anathema. Let him be turned over to God for destruction, if you don't believe as the Roman Catholic Church teaches. We know from Romans 4, 5 that God justifies the ungodly, but once again, Rome says no. Final justification is for those who have been conformed to the righteousness of God. We know from the Bible that justification is the imputation of Christ's completed righteousness to the justified. The righteousness of Christ is imputed or credited to the justified man's account. 2 Corinthians 5.21 shows this so beautifully. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. But once again, Rome says no. 
Justification is not the imputation, but the infusion of righteousness, which renews the interior man. The doctrine of infused righteousness shifts the focus from God's actions to ours, from divine grace to human merit. It points to a salvation that is not a free gift, but something to be earned, and it dissipates over time, if not maintained with works of righteousness. It presents God as a God whose forgiveness is dependent upon our level of righteousness. We know from Scripture that justification is by grace apart from works. Christ's righteousness is given as a gift, Romans 5.17. Rome says justification must include good works. And if you commit a mortal sin, you must be... You must be re-justified, and that is merited by making satisfaction for sins through penance and works of mercy. And then from the Council of Trent, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, let him be anathema. Please don't miss this. Once again, the Catholic Church has condemned all of us because we all know that we are justified by faith alone. After justification, all sins are no longer taken into account. We see this from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5. God is reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ, not counting men's sins against them. They're no longer taken into account. Why? Because they were all placed on Christ. But once again, Rome opposes this teaching It says all sins committed after justification may be punished in purgatory or in hell. In Romans 8.1, we see that God promises to glorify everyone he justifies because those justified can never, ever be condemned. The great promise in Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I was teaching on a cruise to Israel, there was a Roman Catholic priest on board, and I was sharing the gospel with him, and I said, is it true that you believe baptism is the sacrament of justification? Yes, that's what we teach. And you also teach that if that person commits a mortal sin and dies in that state, then he will go to hell. He said, yes, that's what we teach. I said, then how do you explain Romans 8.30? where it says, those God justifies, he glorifies. He scratched his head and said, you know, we just don't have an answer for that. We don't have an answer for that? Why don't you repent and believe the gospel? As Rome says, God will condemn to hell everyone who is justified, but who dies in mortal sin. Well, Rome's apostasy was complete in the 16th century, In fact, in 1545, Rome deliberately and dogmatically departed from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Her apostasy had been progressive for 1,100 years, but this is where it officially and dogmatically departed from the faith. Her apostasy is documented by over 100 infallible anathemas that condemn anyone who does not believe Rome's corruption of the gospel. The council also placed the list, the, the Bible on the list of forbidden books. Now, doesn't this puzzle you? Why would a church who claims to be the one true church founded by Christ remove the word of God from its people? You know why? The truth was setting people free. They were reading the Bible. They were realizing they had been deceived. And Jesus in John 8, 31 and 32 said, A true disciple of mine is one who abides in my word. Then they will know the truth, and the truth will set them free, free from religious bondage. So Rome said, we can't allow this anymore. If you had a Bible in your possession in the 16th century, you could not have your sins forgiven until you returned it to the Catholic Church. Well, The Roman Catholic Church has a different path to eternity. Jesus referred to it as the wide road that leads to destruction. 
Roman Catholics believe they are born destined for hell because of Adam's sin, but by water baptism they are now justified and on their way to heaven. But as they commit these lesser sins called venial sins, they lose some of their right standing before God. When they commit a mortal sin, they're de-justified, and they have to be re-justified by doing good works and receiving the sacraments. Catholics go through this hundreds of times, never knowing where they stand before a holy and righteous judge. At the end of a Catholic's life, if he's never heard the gospel or if he's rejected it, he will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and he will hear the most terrifying words anyone could ever hear when Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you, and they're cast into the eternal lake of fire. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it's for this reason I have such a love and compassion for Roman Catholics. I was on this wide road to destruction for half of my life. The only way Catholics will know they've been deceived is if they are lovingly confronted with the truth. We need to show them the narrow way that leads to life. Yes, we're born destined for hell, but it's not water baptism, but it's faith in Christ. And at that very moment, we are justified. And then we begin the process of sanctification through the power of the Holy Spirit, putting to death the evil deeds of the flesh in conforming our life to the life of Christ. That great promise, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So at the end of a believer's life, he will either be raptured or when he stands before the Lord Jesus, we all hope to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then we'll sing his praises throughout all eternity. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Do we have a glorious gospel to proclaim? Well, when we look at the gospel's purity and exclusivity, we must defend the purity of the gospel by proclaiming the sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing can be added to the perfect finished work of Christ. Anyone who thinks that Christ did only 99% and now they have to do their part is woefully deceived and has insulted their Savior. If anyone had reason to boast in his religious resume, it was the Apostle Paul. I love taking Catholics to Philippians chapter 3, verses 3 to 9. And there you see Paul talking about everything he had done as one of the most righteous Jews of all time. And yet in the end, he considered it all dung, rubbish, for knowing Christ Jesus as his Savior. He recognized his righteousness was inadequate. He exchanged it for the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Claims of exclusivity are often met with resistance in places where different religious paths are accepted as equally valid. But we must defend the exclusivity of the gospel by proclaiming the necessity of Christ. No one can be saved except through the one mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ. So what must we do with a message like this? I hope you recognize there is a battle going on. It's a very intense warfare. We must enlist in the Lord's army to fight the good fight of faith. That ne means we need to put on the armor of God and be ready to fight. We need to contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Not passively, not whenever we feel like it. The exhortation is to commit, co contend earnestly for the faith. You know, so many Roman Catholics want to take us out of the scriptures and point to the early church fathers. But this is a great verse to share with them because our faith, the deposit of our faith, was signed, sealed, and delivered in the first century. This is the faith that we are to contend for, not the faith of the early church fathers, because you will find them on both sides of every issue. Contend for the faith that is gloriously revealed in Scripture. We need to have a sense of urgency to proclaim the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God help us all to do that.
Thank you for the opportunity to share a great burden on my heart this morning. May God be glorified as we go out and not only contend for the glorious gospel, but also proclaim it to those who are perishing.